Hey guys, so this is going to be the ultimate course on investing in real estate and investing in the stock market in your 20s, so I highly recommend watching from beginning to end. We're going to take a look at house hacking using my actual numbers. We're going to look into how to become a millionaire using diversified index funds, and we're also going to talk about the Roth IRA account and more. Also, guys, I have nothing for you to click. There is no affiliate, no sponsor, no pitch. This is what I call 100% straight value, so let's dive right in. What we're looking at here is a simple example of a single family home on the left and then a duplex on the right, as this is the most simple approach to house hacking. A lot of people don't want to become landlords owning tons of units, and I definitely get where you're coming from, but owning just one additional unit here with a duplex can have a huge financial benefit. So you should definitely consider at least taking the duplex approach in buying a two family property. If you go the single family route, yes, you're building equity with your mortgage, but you don't have any write-offs and you don't really have any tax benefits. And let's say for example, your mortgage is $2,000 per month. Well, you're going to be paying that entire amount yourself and that is you alone footing the bill maybe you have roommates or a spouse or for example but you don't have any tenants paying you rent let's now assume instead that you were to buy a two-family property of equivalent value in that area what those numbers would look like instead we're going to say it's the same mortgage of two thousand dollars but instead of just paying that for yourself you end up living in one of these units and then renting out the other unit. And let's say, for example, you're able to rent this out for $12.50 per month. Well, you have that rental income offsetting most of your mortgage, and that means that you're only paying $750 per month of that mortgage. And that's a huge difference versus paying $2,000 per month. And this right here is just by having one additional unit. If you end up getting a triplex or a quadplex, you can get these numbers even better to where you could potentially have a house hack where you're not paying anything for your particular unit. That's what you can do with multifamily real estate. That's how I got started with house hacking and it's definitely the approach I would recommend following, but it does require some discipline to save the money required to get your foot in the door with real estate. Here are the two major purchases that you need to get yourself set up for in your 20s. Number one, you're gonna to want to invest in a reliable vehicle that you own outright. A lot of people end up driving a beater car in their teenage years if they have a car at all, and maybe that gets you through college, but in your 20s, that's when you often need to sell that car or just get rid of it and get something else. Now, we're not talking about taking on a car loan or anything like that. I'm talking about purchasing something outright, and I would recommend investing anywhere from $10,000 to $20,000 twenty thousand dollars here depending on what you're looking for so you're not going to be getting a brand new vehicle but you're looking at something that's maybe two or three years old possibly a little bit older but i would definitely stick to something like a honda or toyota that's going to last you for a while having a car payment in your 20s is not recommended because you should be investing that money instead as this is the time when you have the longest horizon to allow that money to grow as you're going to see later and then the second major thing you need to set yourself up for is purchasing real estate. Now for myself, I ended up going the multifamily house hacking route with my first real estate purchase, but you yourself may be looking to go the single family route if you're looking to just own a home and then start a family or something like that. But in order to invest in real estate, you are going to need to save up a good sum of money. It's going to be anywhere from $50,000 to $100,000 or more, depending on the strategy that you plan on following, your local market, and all sorts of things like that. Now, this may seem challenging here because in your 20s, these are going to be your lowest earning years in most cases. So it may seem difficult to save up this large sum of money, but it is definitely possible with the proper discipline. And just think about, for example, if you're able to knock out the first item here of owning a reliable vehicle, well, simply not having a car payment could be $500 a month that you're able to instead direct into your savings towards your first real estate purchase. So now that we understand these major life purchases that you have to set yourself up for in your 20s, let's now start talking about the steps that you need to take to get there. And the very first one is establishing and building credit. 
Now, for me personally, I started off with a secured credit card at my local bank when I was 18 years old. And then once I turned 20, I ended up getting an offer in the mail for the Discover student credit card. I applied for that. I was accepted. And I'm a big fan of this credit card as a result. I'm not endorsed by them or affiliated by any means, but this has been a solid credit card for me and they have great customer service. And what you want to do with this credit card is use it for purchases like gas, for example, and then every single month pay off that balance in full and just by taking those simple steps you're establishing credit and building your credit every single month now with that being said credit cards can be a slippery slope for a lot of people because it requires a lot of discipline to be able to have money available to you that you're not using a lot of people treat credit cards like cash in the bank and it is not that whatsoever and ask anybody who has been over their head in credit card debt it is a very stressful situation that nobody would want to get into themselves so establish these good habits early right here we're looking at Forbes for the average credit card interest rate and right now that's coming in at a 24.76%. Let's assume somebody who was irresponsible ended up racking up a $5,000 credit card balance. Well, let's take a look at how much interest that would be annually. On a balance of $5,000, if you're paying 24.76% interest, that means every single year, $1,238 is strictly interest, not even touching the amount that you've borrowed. So let's split that up over 12 months, and that's going to be a dollar value here of $103 a month. Even on a small credit card balance of $5,000, you'd be paying over $100 a month in interest. And if you were making the minimum payment on your credit card, for example, that's barely going to probably touch any principal if it touches any whatsoever, meaning all you're doing is paying that interest and not paying off that loan to the bank. So this is the slippery slope to avoid. Pay your balance in full every single month and use credit as a tool. Do not use credit to go out there and buy stuff that you wouldn't ordinarily be buying. The next thing I want to talk about is automating your approach to saving money because let's be honest here, you have to save up a crap ton of money to buy real estate today. Saving up for a house, you're talking anywhere from fifty dollars to $100,000 or more in some cases, depending on what strategy you're following and then the type of loan that you're using. Now, if you plan on buying real estate or making a major purchase within the next five years, most experts recommend just stashing your money into a high yield savings account and not investing it at all because you're not guaranteed to have a positive return on any investment in that short of a time horizon. And you don't want to tie your much needed cash up into financial assets that could lose value, especially if you have a long term goal of buying real estate, for example. One of the examples here for a high yield savings account is CIT Bank, depending on how much money you have. They have up to a 5.05% APY on balances above $5,000. Once again, I'm not sponsored or endorsed by them in any way, but I did some research and found this to be the most competitive rate. And with inflation currently sitting at around 3%, this is safely outpacing inflation, and that 5% APY is fantastic. I'm doing this with my savings. I have a lot of cash sitting on the sidelines in both my emergency fund as well as my war chest. I'm totally fine with sitting in cash right now because of this favorable rate that we're able to get with our high yield savings. So what I recommend doing here is getting set up with a high yield savings account and then automating your savings. If you don't do these things automatically, odds are you're not going to do them whatsoever. Now there is one tool that I want to mention here called the FHA loan. And it's something I used myself back in 2019 when I got into my first piece of real estate. And the benefit here is that when you're in a low interest rate environment, which we're not right now, but I'm gonna teach you this for the next time that happens. Something called the FHA loan is a solid tool to use because you can get a mortgage with as little as 3.5 percent down and in many cases you can actually borrow additional money to put towards your closing costs meaning that you can have a very small amount that you have to put down and with the current interest rate environment i really wouldn't recommend taking on a loan for real estate whatsoever instead i would keep your cash 
stockpiled, keep building it up and remain patient on the sidelines because we've seen this before, rates go up and then rates come down. So it's really just a matter of time until that happens again. Now I'd like to start talking about long-term investing using the stock market. You definitely want to get your foot in the door with real estate in your 20s in terms of just owning where you live. And I'm a big fan of owning multifamily real estate because you can have your tenants paying off your mortgage and then you yourself can house hack and this can allow you to maximize your rate of investment. Well, I'm gonna be showing you the Warren Buffett approach to investing, which is simply dropping your money into to the S&P 500 and investing for the long haul. Now in your 20s, you might be tempted to invest in individual stocks, maybe it's cryptocurrencies, NFTs, things like that. And if you do decide to do that, you're gonna wanna do this in a separate account from your long-term investment strategies because there's a crucial difference between investment versus speculation. What works best for the majority of people is long-term index fund investing. You see, Warren Buffett made this famous bet against hedge funds, betting that over a 10-year period, the S&P 500, which is just the 500 largest publicly traded U.S. companies, would outperform a portfolio of five actively managed hedge funds. Now, hedge funds, if you're not familiar, are active managed funds where there's a lot of fees involved because there's often very complicated strategies and a lot of trading in and out of the market. These traders are professional traders with finance degrees, with access to cutting edge platforms and all of the latest technology and things like that. Whereas you yourself as a retail investor are just sitting at home looking at your phone in most cases to trade stocks. The outcome here was astounding. The portfolio of the five hedge funds after fees had a return of just 36.3% over a 10 year time horizon. Meanwhile, the S&P 500 returned 125.8%. The S&P 500 blew the active portfolio out of the water. So if they are not able to beat the market, you yourself have very little to no chance of beating the market. That's why it's just a waste of time and not something that I would personally recommend doing. Instead, you should just plop your money into index funds, just like Warren Buffett is talking about here. And this is his recommendation to investors, both large and small. This right here is my favorite view of the S&P 500. These are the largest 500 companies in the US and the size of the square indicates the size of the company. This is what's called a market value weighted index and that means the more valuable the company is, the greater weight they carry across the entire portfolio. What's interesting about that is when you're investing in the S&P 500, which is the exact strategy that Warren Buffett used to beat those hedge funds in his bet, you own a little piece of all of these companies, but the majority of your money goes into the largest publicly traded companies. So that means companies like Microsoft, you have Apple, you have Nvidia, Google, Meta. The larger the company is, the more of your money invested is allocated to those. And one of the many benefits here is that you have built in diversification. Up top, you can see the specific sectors such as healthcare, consumer defensive, uh, technology, financial. And then within those, you have individual industries like credit services, banks, insurance, et cetera. So you're invested across all of these different segments of the economy, meaning that you do not have all of your eggs in one basket. If one segment of the economy or one company does poorly, you have all of these other things buoying your portfolio and allowing you to ride it out. Now we're going to take the average return from the S&P 500 and project out into the future, seeing how much money you can build if you start in your 20s and follow a long-term index fund investing strategy. Now, according to Investopedia, the S&P 500 has had an average annualized return of 11.88% since its 1957 inception. So we're going to go with that figure here for our compound interest calculation. We're going to be assuming that you're starting off with an initial investment here of $0, and then we're going to figure that you're contributing $50 a week to your investment portfolio. Not a lot of money, 50 bucks out of every single paycheck. You're definitely going to want to ramp that up over time, but I wanna show you how in your 20s, because of this long time horizon that you have, 
you can still take advantage of the long-term wealth building effect of compound interest, and you don't need to put in a heck of a lot of money to see serious results. So we put 200 there as the monthly contribution, and then for the interest rate, we went with the 11.88%. The first thing we're gonna do is project out 10 years into the future. Maybe you started this at age 20. Where would you then be at age 30? After 10 years, you'd have a portfolio value here of just under 42,000. And in terms of your contributions versus your gains, you have invested $24,000 in your portfolio based on that average return would be worth just under 42,000. That means you've made about $18,000 in gains from the stock market from 24,000 that you put in. At this point, we're now going to project out another 10 years into the future, and most people would think that this portfolio would be worth roughly double, maybe $80,000, but this is where you begin to see the wealth building power of compound interest because it grows at a faster rate every single year. At the 20-year mark, you would have $170,500. So maybe you started this at age 20 and now you're at age 40 sitting on this amount of money. This is about four times the figure that we just looked at and that just goes to show you how fast your money grows with compound interest. So in terms of your total contributions, you've contributed about 48,000 and the total value of your portfolio is 170,000. At the 30 year mark, which maybe at that point you'd be 50 years old if you started at 20, you're looking at half a million dollars. And once again, we're talking about investing 50 bucks out of every single paycheck. We're not talking about a large sum of money. If you see this and you're like, wow, I wanna build wealth even faster, you can ramp up those contributions and get to your goal a lot quicker. In this case here, you've now contributed a total of 72,000 and your portfolio has grown to 565,000. You've made almost half a million dollars in gains from the stock market, which is absolutely mind blowing. And at the 35 year mark, which maybe you're 55 years old, if you start at 20, you could officially call yourself a millionaire as you'd have a portfolio worth a million dollars, 7,000 and some change. Now, in terms of your total contributions, that's 84,000, meaning you've made about $920,000 in capital gains from the stock market. This is why it's so important to start when you're young because you have all of these years early on where it doesn't really seem like anything is happening. It seems pretty boring, but just look at what happens after that 10 year mark, things get a lot more exciting. And then at the 20 year mark, that curve just starts taking off. At the 30 year mark, it's at a, going at a faster and faster rate and things become really exciting. This right here is the true proven method for building wealth in the stock market. It's not through stock picking. It's not by picking the next big crypto or getting into NFTs. Like I said, if you want to speculate with those kind of things while you're young, you do have the ability to take on that risk, but you don't want to take that money that could go into a strategy like this and direct it into something that could potentially lose all of its value because you could have instead followed a strategy like this that's proven to make people a millionaire. Now that we understand why investing in the broad market is the best strategy to follow, let's now talk about how to put that into action. What we're looking at here is the Vanguard 500 Index Fund, and this is a type of mutual fund, but instead of having these stock pickers following an active approach with that money, instead you have a group of fund managers who are following a very passive approach where they're simply mimicking or copying a benchmark as closely as possible. So in this case, they're looking to replicate the performance of the S&P 500 or that heat map that I showed you earlier as closely as possible. If we click here on fund management, you can see the particular fund managers below. And instead of paying very high fees like you would with a mutual fund, these come with significantly lower fees. Now, this particular method of investing in index funds is not what most people follow today because there's a high minimum investment here of $3,000 and it's more difficult to trade in and out of the fund. So what most people prefer is the ETF or exchange traded fund, which is simply where they take a fund like this, split that up into shares, 
and then allow those shares to trade on the major exchanges. So if we click right over here, we can now jump over to VOO, which is the Vanguard S&P 500 ETF, allowing you to invest in the broad S&P 500, just like you're buying a share of a stock. And this ETF has an expense ratio of 0.03%. That's astronomically low, very, very low fees associated with that investment. And that's important because that means the majority of your money remains invested. They do pay a dividend here. And earlier on, when we looked at that compound interest example, that was assuming dividend reinvestment. So this pays a 1.45% yield. So on $10,000, you'd be looking at $145 in annual dividends paid out on a quarterly basis. So what you'd want to do to maximize your rate of return is take that dividend, it would be about $35 per quarter, and you'd want to buy more of VOO if you were investing directly in this ETF. Now, a lot of brokerages today offer fractional shares. The share price here is 404 and 16 cents. But if you're using a brokerage that offers fractional investing, in many cases, you can invest as little as one single dollar into the particular ETF. Let's take a look under the hood now and see what this ETF is about. If we scroll down here, you get more information about year-to-date performance, for example, which right now the year-to-date returns on this is 15.93%. We've had a decent rally in the stock market um, this year compared to where we were at at the beginning of the year. So just investing in a diversified manner here would have given you that near 16% return. So if you're a stock picker yourself, or maybe you've been investing in crypto, you have to ask yourself, hey, have I had above a 16% return this year so far and if you haven't then you're not beating the market and you're wasting your time with an active strategy that's just not working for you later on i'm going to show you how to open up a vanguard brokerage account and if you do that you can buy shares of voo and invest a minimum of one single dollar so it's crazy to think that but in this day and age you can take one dollar and invest it in a diversified manner across the 500 largest companies in a very low fee manner. Now, just to convey how crazy low that expense ratio is, the average expense ratio of similar funds is 0.79%. And again, this is 0.03%. That is significantly lower than the average. Now, earlier when we were looking at that S&P 500 heat map, I was talking about how all of the segments of the economy were broken up into sectors and then industries. This pie chart right here shows you a visualization of the percentage of your money that flows into each particular sector based on the exposure within that portfolio. So let's go ahead and walk through this now. The biggest category here is information technology and 28.1% of your money flows into that category. That's definitely going to be a growth category for you and there's growth potential there going into companies like in Nvidia, for example, and Apple. The second biggest category here is healthcare. 13.1% of your money is flowing into that. Below that, financials at 12.6%. And then you have 106 going into consumer discretionary. Between these three right here, between information technology, healthcare, and financials, that is more than 50% of your allocation flowing right into those sectors. And this right here breaks down the individual stock allocation, showing you how much of your money on a percentage basis goes into these particular stocks at this point in time. So for example, if you invest in VOO, 7.53% of the fund as it stands right now is Apple stock. So that's seven and a half cents out of every dollar invested going right into Apple. Below that is Microsoft at 6.47%. So just between Apple and Microsoft, that accounts for 14% of the entire VOO fund going right into those giants because of how large they already are and how significant they are in today's economy. Below that, we have Amazon and then NVIDIA, and then you have Alphabet followed by Tesla. Facebook, and then the other class of Alphabet shares. There's a voting and non-voting class. And then there's Berkshire Hathaway, followed by United Health Group. And the reason why you want to invest in index funds versus individual stocks is a lot like the analogy here of betting on a horse race. 
it's difficult to figure out what horse is going to come in the lead, even if you have access to all of the statistics and jockey information and all of that, as there's a lot of randomness to that kind of thing. And trying to pick a winning stock is a lot like picking the winning horse of a race. You could look at all the numbers in the world, but if there's something random that happens beyond your control, it could completely wipe you out in terms of you're wrong and maybe you lose a ton of money. With individual stock ownership, there's significant risk. You're not diversified and you just never know what's going to happen. You could also be successful with a stock picking strategy over and over, but if you make one bad move, you could potentially take yourself and set yourself way back if you experience a significant loss. That's why investing in an index fund is like betting on this entire horse race. And if all of the horses do well, then you earn a little bit off of each one. And that's really like investing in the S&P 500. Now, when you're investing for the long term, it's important that you don't put all of your money into anything at once. And that's because it's difficult to know where we are at in the market, if not impossible, in terms of timing things. The stock market goes up and the stock market goes down. That's what we're looking at here with the S&P 500 over the last three years and you would want to be trickling your money into the market at routine intervals over time versus dumping your money into the markets at once. Earlier on, we were talking about taking 50 bucks out of every paycheck and putting that into the stock market. Well, if you automated that and you invested 50 bucks every week into the S&P 500, maybe you buy VOO with a brokerage that offers fractional shares, that would be a perfect example of dollar cost averaging because you're buying a little bit at a time and then you're buying it when the market is low and then you're also buying it as the market goes higher. You're also buying it as it goes back down. And what that means is over time you end up paying the market average for those shares and this can help you avoid overpaying. Whereas maybe somebody who dumps money into the market, maybe you bought you know, at the end of 2021, you could have put a ton of money into the S&P 500 and still have been in negative territory because the S&P 500 hasn't cracked that figure even just yet. So that's why you wouldn't want to just dump all of your money in. You'd want to buy at routine intervals over time, dollar cost averaging. Now, one thing that's really important to think about with any investing strategy is the taxes associated with that investment. Earlier, we were looking at an example of potentially generating over $900,000 in capital gains from the stock market. And as I'm sure you can imagine, that could come with a significant tax bill, depending on what type of account you are investing in. Most people are familiar with a traditional brokerage account where you're trading stocks with your post-tax income and then you pay taxes on your trades at the end of the year. But I wanna show you something called the Roth IRA account, which you should definitely be aware of as if you're investing for the long term, it comes with some significant tax advantages. In a nutshell here, investing with a Roth IRA can allow you to let your money grow tax-free and also allow you to avoid taxes on your dividends so long as you're willing to leave your earnings in that account to the age of 59 and a half. And you also need to have the account for at least five years. So if you're in your 20s, that's no problem. Uh, but maybe if you're investing in your 50s, for example, you'd have to factor that in. But the benefit here is that you can allow your money to grow and experience all of those decades of compounding and not have to worry about the tax bill whatsoever, so long as you're willing to leave your earnings until 59 and a half. If you take them out early, you're going to pay penalties and taxes. Now you are able to withdraw your contributions, meaning the dollar value that you put in at any time without paying taxes or penalties. And that is a good thing to be aware of. Now there are eligibility limits in terms of how much money you can make but that's well into the six figures so in your 20s most people are not making that much so this is definitely a good time to take advantage of something like that and in terms of how much money you can put into this account they change it every couple of years for 2023 that's going to be $6,500 if you're under the age of 50 and then $7,500 if you're over the age of 50. the strategy we talked about earlier of investing 50 bucks a week is $2,400 per year so if you were doing this with a Roth IRA you would be well under the limit in terms of how much you can contribute and that would mean that on all of those gains you're not paying any taxes 
And on $900,000 of gains, you could be talking about $200,000 of taxes potentially, depending on your tax bracket and what state you live in, for example. You would also have to pay taxes on those dividends that you're earning every single year, even though you're just potentially reinvesting them back into the portfolio. That's why the Roth IRA can be a really important option. I'm gonna show you now how to open up a brokerage account or Roth IRA account with Vanguard. And once again, this is not sponsored or anything like that. They're just a solid platform that's been around for a long time. But you may also want to look into other platforms like Fidelity or Charles Schwab, for example, that are also very reputable in this space. What we're gonna do is click on the red get started button and it's going to start the account wizard and it's asking us what we're looking to do at this point in time. Do we want to open a new account with money from my bank? That's definitely what we're looking to do. I've selected open a new account with money from my bank and we're gonna click on the black continue button. At this point, you choose between whether or not you want Vanguard Advice Services or if you're going to do things on your own. What I've been showing you so far, talking about ETF investing, if you're just looking to automatically invest into ETFs, that's something you can easily do on your own. We're going to select that option here. And now you can choose between logging in with your existing account or creating a new account. If you already have a Vanguard account for something like your 401k, you can click on log in, but if not, you can click on the sign up button. And that brings you here to this screen, which tells you what you need to open an account, which is a permanent US residence, employer address, and social security number. When you're ready, you can click on select your account. And this is where you have the different options. If you want to jump right into the Roth IRA and invest for the long haul and you know avoid that massive tax bill, you would check this box, which is retirement investing. And then you have the traditional, the Roth and the minor IRA. We didn't get into the traditional IRA. That's more like the 401k where the benefits up front. Um, but what we did talk about was the Roth IRA. If you wanted that, you would select this and click on continue. But we're going to instead just select general investing. Let's assume that you don't want to invest in a retirement account because you want to be able to access those earnings at any time. Well, at this point, you would choose between individual, joint, or trust. Unless you're opening up an account on behalf of someone else or with someone else, you're going to select individual, and then you're going to click on the black continue button. At this point, you're going to input your information. So I'm just going to put some fake info in here and then we'll continue to the next step. Once you've inputted your information, you can click on the black continue button. And now you're going to verify your home address as well as your phone number. And once you have all that information in place, you can click on continue once again. And at this point, you have to verify all of the information that you've entered up until this point. If everything looks good, you can click on the black continue button. Now, at this point, I would have to upload a photo ID, which I don't have as this is not my actual information, but you yourself would upload your ID, get your account verified, and then you can link your bank account. And then at that point, you could buy shares of the ETF VOO that we were looking at earlier or explore other stocks and ETFs available through the brokerage. Now, asset allocation is also important to consider, and that's the percentage of your money that you're investing across different asset classes. We've talked about investing in real estate as well as investing in the stock market, and those are separate. But even within the stock market, you want to have separate allocations between bonds and stocks. Now, this becomes more important as you get older, and many would argue that in your 20s, you really don't need to have any bond exposure but you should talk with a financial advisor about your specific situation if you want to get anything tailored to your specific needs. But this here is going to show us a general guideline. We're looking at bogleheads.org, which is a great resource for index funds, especially Vanguard, as this is a resource named after John Bogle. But nonetheless, his actual recommendation here was to put roughly your age in bonds. So based on his advice at age 20, you might want to have 20% of your money in bonds and 80% in stocks or equities. The problem being is that might be too conservative in this day and age, especially because people are living a lot longer. That's why many would follow a different approach. There's another common approach, which is taking 120 and subtracting your age. And that's the percentage that you would ideally want to have in equities. That's more of an aggressive approach. 
So following this John Bogle approach, if you were 25 years old, you might want to have 25% in bonds and 75% in stocks. And you could simply accomplish that by putting 75% in VOO and then 25% in a bond ETF like BND, for example, also offered through Vanguard. But if you followed the 120 rule, you would instead be taking 120, subtracting 25, and that would say, okay, 95% of my money would go in equities and 5% would go into bonds. Now, if you're investing for the long haul and you don't want to worry about things like asset allocation or rebalancing, which is important too, that's where you have to, over time, make sure that you don't have too much money in stocks and not enough in bonds based on the market outperforming the bonds. And so that would mean you'd have to sell off a little bit and buy more of the bond fund and do this over time, but also making sure that as you get older, you're adjusting your allocations following one of those guidelines or perhaps a different guideline about the percentage allocation into those. What we're looking at right here would be for somebody who doesn't want to deal with any of that, and these are called the target retirement funds. They're for long-term investing. And what you do is simply scroll down and figure out your target retirement year, and you can do this based on your birth year, or if you know roughly when you want to retire, you can use that here as well. But let's say, for example, you were in the birth year of 1990, you would fall here in this category, and that would be the target retirement 2055 fund. And if we click on this right here, this right here is a target retirement fund for that specific year that does have a $1,000 minimum investment, which is not super high, but it's a little bit more than the ETFs. But this has built-in rebalancing and built-in reallocating, meaning you don't have to worry about any of that that we just discussed in terms of adjusting your allocations over time and making sure that you have the right percentages in these different buckets. This just does it all for you automatically. The last thing I wanna cover here are some major pitfalls to avoid in your 20s that could really screw you up up on this journey and I am going to start right in here on student loans that's the very first thing I would make sure you avoid unless you have the ability to get scholarships and things like that I really don't recommend going into a mountain of debt for education as the payoff and the ROI on that is just not as good as it used to be there's plenty of options for community college or getting into trades or different avenues where you don't have to force something to work. Now, if you're academically at the top of your school and you have scholarships or maybe you're doing sports and you can get a free ride or a lower cost tuition, definitely take advantage of that. But that's really the only scenario where I would recommend doing anything but simply going to community college or maybe learning a skilled trade or tapping into the uh, gig economy instead. Another one that's pretty much a given here is avoiding any kind of personal debt loans. This is credit cards. The reasons are obvious. It's just going to set you back. If you make mistakes in your 20s and take on debt and credit cards, you're just gonna be paying off that mountain of debt just to get yourself back to that zero dollar line before you can even build up any assets. So don't make the mistake here of using your credit card, maxing it out, or taking on an auto payment. I don't think you should have any auto loan at all in your 20s or possibly ever in your life. Ultimately, what you want to do here is live below your means because as a result, you're going to maximize your rate of savings, which will allow you to put enough money together to get into the real estate game, or it's going to allow you to put enough aside to invest in that brokerage account or retirement account that's gonna set yourself up for success later in life. In your 20s, you have time on your side, take advantage of that time. You've already seen what it can do in terms of the wealth building power of compound interest. All you have to do now is get dialed in on the specific strategy, whether you're gonna do VOO, for example, and dollar cost average making monthly or maybe weekly contributions, set it and forget it, and you're gonna be glad you did it looking back.
So that's the gist of investing in your 20s. I hope you guys enjoyed this video. If you did, please make sure to drop a like as well as subscribe and hit the bell for future notifications. The last thing I want to mention here is that I do have a book called From Side Hustle to Main Hustle to Millionaire. So if you are looking to build additional income streams outside of just having a nine to five job, maybe you're looking to invest more money into the stock market or save up faster to get into real estate, well, a side hustle is a fantastic way to do that. You can grab a copy of my book at libraries across the United States, but it's also in person at Barnes & Noble, or you can find it on Amazon, as well as an author narrated version on Audible. This is a step-by-step -step guide on building a side hustle in my exact footprint, and we cover options for both digital side hustles as well as what I call real-world side hustles, where you're providing a service or product of some kind in the real world. If you enjoyed this video, be sure to check out my full-length Stock Market for Beginners course. That's going to be the card in the corner. It's also going to be linked up in the description below. You can click now to start watching that. Don't forget to subscribe and hit the bell, and I'll see you next time.